Hi everybody, my name is Carol and welcome to the study of Art History Survey 1, which will be a study of art from prehistory 30,000 years ago up until roughly the 13th century, 12th or 13th, around what we call Gothic times at the age of the great cathedrals. I think what I would like to just say to you about the study of art history in general is that it's not an art class. It's not a history class. It's not a criticism class. Art history is a pretty unique phenomenon in that the thing that we're thinking about is what did people make and why? What was the culture that the artwork made within? What were those people like? Why did they make the works they made? And I have found over the years that I've been teaching this that there seems to be a deeper reason that all people have made art, whether it's prehistoric cave art, whether it's a modern artist who's like Jackson Pollock who's throwing paint on a canvas on the floor, there seems to be this need inside, this place inside of us where we want to connect to the greater world at large. And artists are among the few people that are able to do this in a visual way, although of course now we have digital art, we have sound art, we have, but it's all art of the senses. I guess that's what I'm trying to say is that we process the world around us in some kind of way, create an image or a sculpture or a song or a poem and whatever the product of that process is, that's what is presented to the viewer at large and is all different kinds of reasons. Sometimes art is made because it, there's a religion or a ritual or survival. Sometimes it's made just for pure beauty. Sometimes it's propaganda. And in the course of this art history, what we will study is all the different reasons different works of art were made. And so we're going to, it's very important that you see that we look at this art in context. Okay, so what is art? And this first slide has an image of Vincent van Gogh on the left and the Sphinx on the right. Now, the image by Van Gogh, it's an oil painting, it's a self-portrait, and maybe some of you have heard of Van Gogh, he's pretty famous, that's why I put him here. And it's a painting of him painting. So he's making this message, he's creating an artwork to talk about himself, about his own world view. The Sphinx, on the other hand, it's a mystery. Nobody really knows why it was made. Many scholars theorize that it's a portrait of Ramses II. We don't know. It's setting outside the pyramids of Giza. And if you look very, very carefully on the slide, you can see like this little tiny doorway thing. And there might even be some people in there. There's like a little house down by his left paw. That gives you a sense of the scale of this thing, the monumental size of this piece of art that has been around for thousands of years. The interesting thing about these two images is the composition, if you forget about the fact that what they're pictures of, so we have two digital images on a PowerPoint slide inside a computer. Maybe you're looking at this on your phone. Maybe you're looking at it on a laptop. Maybe you're on your iPad. Maybe you're not looking at it in the, at all and you're listening to this lecture in the car, but you are definitely not getting an experience of either artwork as it was created or as it was intended. You're seeing these two artworks put onto this slide as an illustration of what art is. But the composition on these two slides, we have negative space at the top. We have the main figure, which in the picture of the Sphinx, of course, the figure is the Sphinx. Van Gogh is the figure on the left. The shape of his easel roughly is the shape of the pyramid. So compositionally, the photographer has made the, the photographer on the right has used some of the same compositional elements to give the importance of the main subject that Van Gogh did when he made his self-portrait. Now, what we know about Van Gogh is he was schizophrenic. He cut off his left ear. He spent a lot of time in an insane asylum. And we don't know which of his paintings he was making here, but it doesn't matter because 
both of these artworks, what they have in common is they are an expression of a maker to the viewer of something from deep within themselves. In this slide, we're talking about content. Content is the subject matter of a work of art. It's what the artist is representing. So it has to do with the ideas of the artist and it has to do with the ideas of the culture around him. All artwork exists within a particular culture and it is a construct of the ideas, the culture, the environment, and all of those forces that are upon any artist at any given time. The reception of the work also is very different depending on whether that work is viewed within the culture from which it comes or somewhere different. So if you look at this sculpture, you might see a very different idea than that which the original sculptor had intended. This is meant as a view of the, in, the most beautiful woman, the, an ideal of female beauty. And it's a sculpture of Kali, who is a Hindu goddess. And in this guise, she is in her ascetic form, which means that she has given up all things of this earth. And she is meditating on the earth beyond, that she has achieved ultimate perfection. She's given away every single earthly possession. She only eats barely what she needs to be able to be sit up and stay in this meditative state. So the religious worshiper that would view her would see her as an ideal to ascribe to. We, they would see her as beautiful. They would see this as an ideal of female beauty. In our culture, if we saw a picture of a woman that looked like this, we might not think of it as a perfectly beautiful woman because we are trained to have a very different idea of what female beauty is. There are three traditional historical art forms which form what's called in the Western art historical trajectory, the canon. And if you study Dr. Hull's introduction lecture, it's that Word document that I've put in this unit. She gives a very good description of what that canon is. Originally, the first art form was sculpture. As you're going to see, we see prehistoric little figures. There's a Paleolithic figure of a woman that you're going to study in prehistoric art. It predates the cave paintings that we're going to see. Architecture comes a little bit later, and a lot of that has to do with materials and technology, and the fact that in early times we had nomadic cultures. So although they had a form of architecture, we don't really have much record of what it was because their materials would have been transient. They would have used things that were portable. So we don't really have anything to say how sophisticated they were or weren't in their building. But by the time we get to the beginnings of the study of art history as a discipline, the Greeks have come and gone and they have invented a whole system of philosophy and of looking at things. And within the Greek historical trajectory and the Greek philosophical trajectory, architecture was seen as one of the highest forms of creation. So in Western art history, these originally architecture and sculpture were seen as forms of very high art. Painting came a little later, but for the first several centuries of the study of art history, these three forms, painting, architecture, and sculpture, were considered the traditional true art forms. And other kinds of media, a lot of the things on the list in the two previous slides, were not considered as seriously. So to illustrate this idea, this painting, this is a fresco, which is uh, wet plaster mixed with pigment and placed on a wall. So they literally, if you've ever seen plaster, maybe when you were little, you made plaster out of a mask or they used to make casts out of plaster if you broke your leg. It's like a white powder made out of gypsum and it hardens up. So these early Italian artists, this is a Renaissance. So it's actually, you're not going to study this in this course. This is a survey one course, but I'm showing it to you here to help you understand the way that we look at art and how it's changed. So today, Leonardo da Vinci is thought of as one of the greatest artists in the history of Western art. 
However, at the time that he made this painting, this was seen as a mural. It was on a cafeteria wall. It's on the wall of the refectory in a monastery. And if you look at the bottom of this painting, you see that door? That door was actually added a little later. The monks just chopped the door right into the painting. It was as if you just had any mural, like the mural on the library wall at ETSU, and they just carved the door into it. They did not look at painting at that time as a sacred thing or a valuable thing. The art of the painter was considered a workman. Later on, it got a different view. Architecture can be all different kinds of things. And so I wanted you just to see these two forms just to kind of give you a flavor of it. Now, the one on the top is considered one of the seven wonders of the world. If you ever take a non-Western course, you'll get to see this, you'll get to learn about it. It's called the Taj Mahal, and it was built as a tomb. It's a mausoleum built by a man named Shah Jahan in for his wife who died and is out in India. The image on the bottom is an image of a mammoth bone house. It's actually from the Ukraine and it was made around 16,000 to 10,000 BCE. So the thing about architecture is this. It's three-dimensional and it's made so people could go inside. So it's highly spatial, whatever the design might be. It always has some kind of function, whether it's a place that people live, whether they worship, whether they gather there, market, whatever it might be, it's built for humans to have a use of some form. So again, the Taj Mahal was built as a tomb. So to, to, for the dead to live in, if you will, the image on the bottom, it's a reconstruction drawing. They found the mammoth bones and they could tell by the way the bones were carved, the way that they were put together. But it's always bound by the materials and technology available at the time. So again, although we're really not going to look at that much architecture in this class until Greeks, is the Egyptians and the Greeks are the first real architects. The Egyptians, I would say, in the ancient Near East, we have some ziggurats and Egypt, we start to have temples. In ancient Greece, they actually begin to develop a philosophical system for it. There may have been as sophisticated ideas in building 30,000 years ago. And the only reason that we don't know about it is because the materials that they used have long since disintegrated.